Uh, thank you so much for coming to the fifth annual McKenna Center Distinguished Speaker Series here at St. Thomas University, located on traditional Willistiquay territory. The McKenna Center was established in 2012 and is host to this annual speaker series, student scholarships, faculty research grants, symposiums, and policy forums, and offers students access to real life public policy activities. The center is also able to bring notable leaders to campus to speak with our students, faculty, alumni, and community. And tonight is one of those occasions. And may I say what an honor it is to bring the Honorable Margaret Norrie McCain back to Margaret Norrie McCain Hall. <laughs> Before we formally introduce our speaker, I would like to acknowledge the support for this event from both the St. Thomas University and the University of New Brunswick education programs. This kind of cross-university event that brings communities together is exactly what the McKenna Center is all about. And I would like to send a special thank you out to Stu's Vice President Advancement, Jody Michelle, uh, who has been phenomenal in organizing and putting together tonight's event for all of us. So please give her a round of applause. And now I'd like to introduce the President and Vice Chancellor of St. Thomas University, President Don Russell. Thank you, Jamie, and good evening, everyone, and welcome, as Jamie said, to our fifth annual uh, lecture in the McKenna Center's Distinguished Speaker Series. Before we begin uh, this evening, I want to uh, acknowledge that our community at St. Thomas is grieving. And to say a little bit about uh, Brian Cardi, a professor who passed away yesterday as a result of a tragic car accident. Brian was a respected and admired professor who was held in high regard by faculty and students in the social work department and indeed by our, our entire university community. He specialized in cross-cultural work, crisis counseling, and the activities of nonprofit agencies, and his scholarly interests were rooted in social justice. Brian had an infectious, positive personality, and he always found uh, a way uh, to bring people together. And whether you worked with him full-time or part-time, it was a delight. He will be greatly missed by everyone at St. Thomas. I am pleased this evening to welcome the Honorable Margaret Nori McCain back to St. Thomas. And I also would like to acknowledge the presence of Her Honor, the Lieutenant Governor Jocelyn Roy Vino and her husband Ronald Vivo, uh, Vino, and also of the for, uh, for another former Lieutenant Governor, Graydon Nicholas. It's very rare to have the current Lieutenant Governor and two former <laughs> Lieutenant Governors together in one room. So welcome to all of you. Our speaker this year offers a timely message on the role of education and public policy in supporting our democratic institutions and aspirations. And this is especially important during the present time of change, disruption, and dislocation which we're living in today. Mrs. McCain enjoys a special place on our campus and not because she's speaking in a building that bears her name. The decision by our board in 2005 to name our new building in her honor was an acknowledgement of her outstanding public service to the people of New Brunswick, of her lifelong dedication to ensuring that the importance of education is understood, and of her support for artistic and philanthropic causes. Public service, education, community service. Mrs. McCain, we are delighted to have you with us this evening. Your values resonate strongly with those of St. Thomas University. They are the values that we seek to instill in our, our students through education and by example. We established the Frank McKenna Center in uh, Communications and Public Policy five years ago in recognition of the important role which the humanities and the social sciences have to play in informing the development of good public policy and with the understanding that building public support for wise, well-informed policy 
depends upon effective communication. The way that governments, institutions, and corporations interact with the public has changed significantly. And the way that policy is developed and implemented has also changed. A one-way system that simply informed the public has become a multifaceted, multi-step process that engages the public, stakeholders, advocacy groups, corporations, and citizens groups. As an institution of higher learning, St. Thomas professors like Dr. Jamie Gillies wanted to explore that dynamic. And we wanted to provide our students with the skills fundamental to the development of good public policy and to the execution of successful consultation processes and communication strategies. We wanted to equip them with these skills to use to advance whatever causes inspire them. As the Premier of New Brunswick and as Canada's ambassador to, to the United States, Frank McKenna understood the important role of leading edge public policy. And he also understood that the ability to communicate effectively could bring people together. He uh, also understood the importance of communicating one's informed perspective, not just on political issues, but on any issue of public concern. The range of speakers that we have welcomed to campus as part of the McKenna Center Distinguished Speaker Series have demonstrated that. Our students have heard from ecologist and climate change adaption expert Blair Feltmate, the, le the leader of the Federal Green Party, Elizabeth May, former Senator Michael Kirby, and former Prime Minister Paul Martin. Despite the increasing rate of change, I think that these speakers would agree with Mrs. McCain that we cannot overlook a fundamental starting point, and that is education, which must now, more than ever, actively support our democratic institutions. Mrs. McCain has been a, long been a champion of education and active in public policy. Together with her husband Wallace and her four children, she founded the Margaret and Wallace McCain Family Foundation to promote early childhood education for all of Canada's children. She has made the impact of her early, of early experiences on lifelong learning, behavior, and health her public policy priority. Mrs. McCain also demonstrated concern about family violence long before it had entered fully the mainstream and public mind. Indeed, her concern was evident in her term as the 27th Lieutenant Governor of New Brunswick from 1994 to 1997. She was also a founding member of the Muriel McQueen Ferguson Foundation, whose mission it is to eliminate family violence through public education and research. Her resume is a lengthy list of service to the public, and she has always been slightly ahead of the curve. That is why we're looking forward to her thoughts this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Margaret McCain. Your honors, Honorable Grade Nicholas, wherever you are. <laughs> to all three of you, I'm very honored that you're here tonight. I appreciate your coming. Madam President, thank you for your very, very kind introduction. Members of the Board of Governors, colleagues from the University of New Brunswick, and friends, I do feel as if I I'm home. I especially felt welcome when I saw my name over the door. <laughs> <laughs> I'm honored to be here to deliver the annual lecture for the Frank McKenna Center for Communications and Public Policy. I was here for the opening of this center, and I've never forgotten the Honorable Paul Martin, right Honorable Paul Martin's speech. It still resonates for me. And I think that probably in our mission, we have to do a better job on the communication piece. So that's to come later. <laughs> but I am delighted to be here. Coming back to Fredericton is coming home. And I uh, thank you for the very, very warm welcome, warm in many, many ways. <laughs> but I'd like to begin with a story. 
In the middle of the last century, a young man from rural New Brunswick invited a young woman from rural Nova Scotia for a 10 cent cup of coffee. This led to more dates where they shared their hopes and dreams for the future. His was a dream to start a business of his own. The following year, they married. And soon thereafter, they returned to his home community, where with his brother, they launched their business venture from the product of the land, the lonely potato. They built what is now a multinational frozen french fry corporation, and all they knew about french fries was that they tasted good. That young man was my husband. Canada is a country where such dreams can become a reality with an idea, energy, and perseverance. Our country values and nurtures these characteristics. In Canada, we place high importance on humanity with a low tolerance for corruption. We have a high expectancy for truth and transparency and a low tolerance for racism and discrimination. We are known for our capacity to respect and welcome different cultures and faiths. We reject bigotry, misogyny, and hatred. Speaking in Hamburg, Germany earlier this year, Prime Minister Trudeau warned that these, are fr these values are fragile. When companies post record profits on the backs of workers in low-wage, precarious jobs, people get defeated, he said. When governments serve special interests, instead of the interests of the citizens who elected them, people lose faith. Inequality can make citizens distrust government and employers, and we're watching that anxiety transform into anger on an almost daily basis. We can't go about doing things the same way and expect to succeed in this world. Trudeau called on companies to pay a living wage and governments to create the conditions that promote equality. A decade ago, a very similar narrative went into the creation of my family's foundation. We have made access to quality early childhood education for all our mission. Done well, early education delivers many valuable outcomes, and I will touch on some of those. But what is critical about early education is its capacity to be the great equalizer. Canadian babies are pretty much the same at birth, but by the time they start school there are big gaps in their health, vocabulary and self-confidence. Some will have a much harder time getting along with their classmates and teachers. They may not have the basic skills of their peers, such as how to dress or properly feed themselves. And the sad news is, school won't be able to compensate these children for what they missed in their earliest years. Worse, the difficulties they experience at school entry are likely to grow rather than to lessen over time. As adults, Low levels of literacy will leave them less able to participate, more alienated, more vulnerable to demagogues offering simplistic, dangerous solutions to complex problems. Mr. Trudeau stated what social scientists have been documenting for some time. We are in a period of rapid change resulting in economic dislocation. And this has consequences for how people view democracy and its institutions. Public policy must respond by helping citizens to understand what is happening and by supporting them to adjust. At the same time, it must prepare the next generation to lead and to flourish in the new environment. This is the humane thing to do. It makes economic sense. And the Canada we know depends on it. Look at democracies more long-lived than ours. Britain elected self-harm in the passing of Brexit. The extreme right lies just below the surface across Europe. And Donald Trump may shock, appall, and even entertain, but if the polls are accurate, <coughs> one in four Canadians admire his approach. In 2016, the World Economic Forum released its first list of the world's top 20 countries and Canada 
ranks number two overall, just behind Germany. For quality of life, we rank number one. The stability of our political system, our access to clean air and water, and our comprehensive education and health services contribute to our top spot. So a number two ranking is a very good place to be, and we can be proud of it. But here it is necessary to look, take a closer look at our red flags flapping, income inequality, child poverty, and the gender wage gap. 42% of Canadians are functionally illiterate. Across Canada, high school students are graduating with a general certificate. And this means they are not sufficiently literate or numerate for today's economy. They cannot process written information, operate today's industrial equipment, or drive a high-tech car or truck. So we are graduating far too many to lives of joblessness. Four million Canadians live with food insecurity, with hunger. This is more than 10% of our population. One in five Canadians suffer from mental illness. Unemployment is 6.3%, but youth unemployment is 11.5%. And how much of this is due to lack of job skills? We're not even close to meeting standards in greenhouse emissions. And our record with Indigenous peoples is shameful. The continued underfunding of Aboriginal health, education and social services relative to other Canadians perpetuates the trauma of residential schools. So, we do have serious problems confronting us, and the response must be national and international. In this century, there will be nine billion human beings on the planet. These numbers are changing how we live and organize ourselves. <clears throat> they influence socioeconomic initiatives and infrastructures and test the limits of the environment. Canada will not be immune. The future is already here. Famine has swept across Somalia and other parts of the region. Five years of drought preceded the carnage in Syria. Scarcity of food and water precipitated an explosion of interfaith, interethnic cleansing, which has displaced millions. A fraction of the diaspora has made its way to our shores, and we've welcomed these small numbers, who will make their contributions to building Canada. But what of the millions on the run from war, climate catastrophe, and rulers hostile to them because of their race, religion, gender, <clears throat> or sexual orientation. Instead of a humanitarian response, too often countries seal their doors in response to the fear and anger generated by the likes of Donald Trump. But walls do not make us safer. Our security, indeed our very survival as a species, depends on our ability to close the gap between rich and poor, and to ensure the few generations have the capacity to sustain democratic and pluralistic societies. As humans, we have a distinct capability to innovate, to create technologies, and find solutions to complex problems. But low levels of literacy challenge our ability to do this. The architects that gave rise to Trump know that illiteracy and democracy cannot coexist. And this is why they've made the destruction of public education central to their agenda. Charter schools have not provided families with educational choice or improved children's outcomes. They've made private operators fabulously wealthy with public money. Canada has an advantage. Its schools enjoy high public confidence. In international assessment, we are at the top 10%, but we lag behind the top performers who use their educational system more intently, enrolling children at a younger age and expanding options for working parents. It is in the years before school entry, before school entry, in the first 2,000 days of life, when the foundations of learning, of health and behavior are established. This is when children develop their basic values, their attitudes and skills. Young children have an innate sense of fairness and are capable of cultivating racial and cultural literacies along with numeracy and reading. 
Research by Dr. Connolly at the University of Toronto shows how even infants recognize racial differences. But the more diverse the community they're exposed to, the less likely children are to internalize differences as negative. Yet the views of policymakers, educators, and parents, and the public can foster inequities. So now I will use this platform and the advantage of being over 80 to tell you what I really think. <laughs> Inequity begins early in life when affluent families can buy their children a quality preschool experience while others can't. It is perpetuated when some must go through a demeaning subsidy process for their children to participate. It happens inside classrooms when the promotion of kindergarten readiness suggesting that some children must be made ready to learn. It happens through assessments of very young children used to document the gaps between cultural, racial, and linguistic communities, and then to blame them for their lack of educational progress. It happens with packaged parenting programs aimed at changing parenting styles, cultural practices, or home language. It takes place when ESL students are segregated into English classes, effectively privileging the children of middle-class families with exclusive French edu immersion education. Then there are the assumptions that inequity can be addressed with one-off short-term inter interventions. Prefab kits and boutique programs are imposed on educators without regard for the intimate knowledge that they have of their students. Unfortunately, New Brunswick has fallen prey to this more than most. I cannot stress enough how problematic and how wasteful it is to rely on packaged interventions to reduce learning gaps. They've been created for everything. Literacy, math, music, diversity, parenting, empathy, and so on. And they're developed without consulting public education, its ministries, training colleges, schools, and preschools, but they're marketed to them. As such, if they have any merit, they don't add to the knowledge base, they don't change everyday practice, and they don't change outcomes for kids. Proven to improve children's life chances is quality early education. We are, of course, vested in children's literacy and math skills. We care about school success. And good quality early education is associated with all of these. In addition, the immense value of early education is to allow every child to comfortably <coughs> find his or her place in the diversity that is Canada. By organizing early education to support parents' work, we can reduce inequality that is rooted in poverty. We have a Made in Canada example of this in Quebec. An expansion of early learning and care programs have the number of lone mothers on social assistance and reduce the rate of child poverty by half. The lack of good educational care creates a care penalty for women which negatively impacts their economic well-being over the life course. Precarious work and the high cost of housing and child care contributes to declining birth rates. Women delay having children or to limit their families or forgo children entirely, not by choice, but of necessity. A red flag flapping in a hurricane is young people with so little confidence in their futures that they refuse to have children. We've been working with the Conference Board of Canada on the release next month of what we believe will be a very important study. The Conference Board understands what makes economies work. It documents how inequality drags on Canada's productivity and has analyzed the impact of universal early education on reducing the inequality gap. It, quantities, it, it quantifies early education's lasting benefits for children, particularly those from disadvantaged families. So when those benefits are rolled up to a population level, education returns more than it costs. So there are encouraging signs. We welcome the federal government's renewed interest in early learning and care. We note the efforts made by provinces and territories to expand access and to improve the quality of early year services. And kudos to New Brunswick 
It has prioritized early education and care, even while confronting economic challenges. While early education is a provincial and territorial responsibility, the federal government has a particular responsibility for programming for Aboriginal families. It alone <coughs> has the capacity to support pan-Canadian research and innovation and to provide trans transparent reporting to Canadians on the well-being of their children. Discussions of early education must consider its place within a child and family strategy, and this includes income supports and parental leave. All governments have improved income supports to families, but outside Quebec, Canada's parental leave policy has not changed since 2006, and fewer and fewer new parents have access. Flexible parental leave is a complement to early education, but only 60% of mothers outside Quebec take parental leave when their baby is born. For those under 30,000 a year, the rate is only 40%. The most vulnerable families have the least access to what is supposed to be a universal program. Early education is central to many public priorities, including reducing illiteracy, supporting innovation, attracting and retaining a skilled workforce, increasing fertility, and improving educational outcomes. Together, we need to identify and share new thinking about how, how to spend wiser and expand access while improving quality. Could Wall Ottawa host a clearinghouse of innovative approaches? For example, parental leave is less expensive than childcare for infants. Could we extend it beyond a year? Why not include four-year-olds in under-enrolled kindergarten classes? Better still, enroll them all. What about before and after school programs in schools? Let's think about delinking childcare subsidies from parents' work. Could libraries and schools join forces to share facilities, books, and librarians? How about changing the federal childcare expense benefit a deduction to a benefit? Or include early education in school funding formulas? The possibilities are many and should be explored. Progress must be measurable. So the Early Childhood Education Report evaluates provincial, territorial progress in early childhood programming. With a baseline established in 2011 and subsequent reporting in 2014, scheduled again for 2017 and 2020, it provides an accessible means of communicating progress. Investment in early education also matters. Canadian governments collectively spend the equivalent of 0.6% of Canada's GDP on early learning and care programs. This places us among the bottom third among our OECD counterparts, behind Lithuania and on a par with the US. So it's time for Canada to up its contribution for its youngest citizens. The only province that comes close to reaching the OECD target is Quebec. Quebec's family policy is 20 years old this year. A commission examining its status provides a portrait of a service that helped to transform and modernize Quebec society, but it is now tired. Its facilities and workforce need nurturing. So the commission has made a number of recommendations to improve childcare's contributions to equal opportunity. Central is to replace the idea of daycare as a service so parents can work with a system formally integrated into public education and covered by the same broad principles of universal and free access. Canada is well placed to take up this challenge. We can enhance equity of opportunity by building onto public education to provide every child with the best possible start in life. Early education isn't about desks and miniature textbooks. Rather, educators with specialized training coach children to answer their own questions by exploring options, experimenting, and working cooperatively with others. These rich, playful settings fuel children's natural curiosity and learning soars. Building education downward makes sense. Among our Anglo-American counterparts, Canada has the highest enrollment in publicly funded education. Parent confidence is well-founded. 
Our public schools have produced our premiers and prime ministers, Supreme Court judges, recipients of the Order of Canada, cultural and scientific icons. Schools have helped prepare children born here and abroad to participate in shaping our democratic institutions. As schools respond to their communities across the life cycle, support for public education, for pluralism, and for democracy grows. Early education, it is the great equalizer. I began with a story, and I'd like to end with one. My dear friend, the late Dr. Ann Sherman, who helped organize this tonight, whom I miss terribly, we all do, those of us that work with her at UMB. She was Dean of Education at the University of Rajasthan, and she had a doctoral student from Bhutan. The student lived in Fredericton along with her two young sons. During the holiday season, they heard a lot about Jesus. One day, a seven-year-old commented to Ann that this Jesus guy was a lot like Buddha. <laughs> then Ann agreed, adding that they both believed in a peaceful and loving world. In Canada, Jesus and Buddha can be good neighbors. We can't be complacent about what a marvelous accomplishment this is. We must stand on guard to ensure a Canada where such stories continue to flourish. Thank you.